Hello and welcome, dear listener, to this episode of Talking to Introverts podcast with myself, Sammy Blackford, and my co-host, Denise Oliver. (laughs) I'll take the drum roll. Thank you. (laughs) So we, as you might have guessed, if you've listened to previous episodes and just by seeing the title of this podcast, We are both introverts and we are also both women in business. And as such, we know, network with, collaborate with a lot of other introverted women in business as well. So we get to know the struggles, the problems, the issues that we all have as introverted women in business. And what we're talking about today isn't so much a particular issue for introverted women as such um but it's something that we hear coming up a lot in conversation when we're in networking meetings and the like and that is about niching so for a start i really dislike the term niching i I was about to say (laughs) oh can we use a different word (laughs) or if um because um i think that term comes from america i'm gonna say that's the sense i get on it but sometimes you hear people calling it niching. I'm like, yeah. oh, that's it's even worse. Your niche. It's like, <laughs> it's like knits, doesn't it? Like, so, no, Denise, what shall we call it? I'm just wondering what another word for niche might be. Um, keep talking while I check it out. <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves. Denise is Googling. Um, <laughs> So I talk, when I talk to clients, so I'm a, a brand strategist and this is a big part of the work I do with clients and I call it finding your people. Um, a lot of people would call it finding your tribe, finding your audience, your core client, your ideal client. There are many different terms for this thing. What words have you come up with? This thing. This thing. <laughs> yes, ideal position. Your calling, your vocation, your function, your job, your place. But then a niche is also a thing. So it's a recess, it's an alcove, it's a nook, it's a cranny, it's a plot. <laughs> there you go. You need to find your nook and cranny. There that's you go. What <laughs> yeah, you've got to slot yourself into something, haven't you? And really, that's what it's talking about. But where does the word come from? Yeah, because I know, I uh, like, before being in the business world, I knew a niche as a, like you say, a small recess in a wall. Yeah. And I think it's that, isn't it? It's like the the smallness of it, as opposed to like the whole wall, it's just a small part of the wall. And I think that's the idea of niching or finding your nook and cranny as we're now going to call it. <laughs> yeah, but here's an interesting one. And I quite like this. It's making a nest. Ooh, I quite like that. Yeah, so it's early 17th century um, from French, and it literally means recess from French. Um, But with the Latin twist, it's make a nest. I like that. So what nest are you going to make? Are you going to welcome into your nest? I like that. Yeah. Yeah, Okay, then let's go with our nest. So what's your nest? (laughs) So what it says here as well is that niche was first used in English to refer to a nook in a wall where you could display a statue or something else, like a little nest for decorative objects. And I like that because isn't that what we're we're aiming to do is just display one thing about ourselves rather than a a Welsh dresser full of things. (laughs) Yeah, and I, and I think that's, it works hand in hand, doesn't it, with the idea of a nest? It's Because a nest is generally quite small. There's only room for a few, well, eggs, I suppose, <laughs> in the original sense of a nest. But it's that contained space that's welcoming and warm. And I like that as a way of thinking about your niche that we're not going to call it anymore, but the people that you want to work with, because the whole idea is, so this is a phrase I use a lot and I cannot remember who said it, where I heard it, but it's always stuck with me that if you're talking to everybody in business, you're talking to nobody. And the idea is that when you can hone in on those people that you really love to work with can really help solve their problem 
and you know can pay you money we're all in business we need to be paid and you know how to talk to that specific person or those specific people then you're going to get more response than if you're trying to talk to everybody and you know your messages don't land because oh no she's not talking to me so I like that because it is about honing in it's about reducing down the amount of people that you uh I was going to say target and I hate that word and I can never think of a better word to use speak to through your marketing your branding and all of that um so is that you because we all want to feel special don't we so when we as customers as clients if we approach a business or if we come across a business online or wherever we want to feel special we want to feel like they know us and they are talking to us and they get our specific problem because how many times have you heard i mean we get it quite a bit with the people that we network with oh, but my business is different, you know, it wouldn't work for me. And we all want to feel special. We don't want the bog standard to work for us because, you know, we're different, we're unique, we're special. And that's our job as business owners is to make our clients, before they even pay us a penny, to feel special and feel like we understand them. And that's how we start to build that connection. So building your nest... (laughs) I, I since just looking that up and knowing that it's a French word, so it mm. would be niche, not niche. Yeah. <laughs> Stop saying niche; it just isn't right. Um, and that sense of having that nest, but bringing certain people into the nest to nestle them in, to mm. take care of them, to nurture them. I just suddenly, I'm all right with the word. <laughs> it's the pronunciation. <laughs> that I might not be all right with. Um, and it's just like, yeah, I suddenly makes way more visual sense mm. to imagine that that one coveted space that is, um, is that haven in mm. life, the way life can be so hectic and stressful. No, I'll, I'll go and find my nest to go and settle down in and feel like someone hears me, understands me, and that I know I can be vulnerable with. Mm. Let's face it, you don't want to climb in everyone's nest, do you? <laughs> well, I personally <laughs> <No>. don't. Um, <laughs> and so, because sometimes, you know, having having that space to be vulnerable and to feel safe in that space, is we don't often find that in the world. Yeah. But yeah, and suddenly I'm like, yeah, I'm all, I'm all set to nest with certain people. And I think it's coming back to like the introvertedness, introversion. Um, I think it really kind of speaks more to that, doesn't it? It's like not the going out and sell, 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 but invite people into your nest and, yeah. you know, into your your world, your business, you know, however you want to describe that, to take care of them. And I think that's something that a lot of business owners don't fully understand so we're taught that we like I said we need to go out and sell 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 and that can lead to I know we've talked about this before when you're at a networking meeting and people are just pushing their business cards onto you and hey here's what I can sell you sort of thing and that is really (laughs) off-putting I don't know if that's just to us introverts or if other people feel that as well but I know for me that's really off-putting and exhausting to have that kind of attack from a business person. Whereas, you know, the softer feeling of this is an invitation to come into my nest. This is how I can serve you. And it's again, going back to that serving, isn't it? Rather than pay me money and I'll push this service onto you. It's like, no, how can I serve you? Yeah. How can I take care of you? And yes, as I said, you know, we're in business. We need to be paid, but it's coming at it from a different perspective yeah it just makes so much more sense I mean I have to say I never understood it years ago I was like all over the place and I I know for me that one of the things that I do and this happens way more with introverts than with extroverts is that I go off what feels right and so if something feels right for me it rarely matters what the words are it's just I just get a sense I have to do xyz i have to go in this direction today 
for my health, for you know, my friends, my family, whatever it is. Um, and so it's very much a, an energetic sensation thing that happens. So then when it comes to creating wording based on sensation, it's like, oh, <laughs> how do I encapsulate this? How do I put this into words? And it's honestly taken me years, absolute years to get to a point where I think my... <laughs> Now I'm laughing because I don't know, you can tell me because you've been working on it, that my website speaks to people, speaks to the women that I want to work with. And I'm hoping that when now we're looking at niche and nest and nesting, that when an introverted woman who um, feels like her, she's lost her power, her inner power, her lights dimmed, especially through grief and loss, that... Um, that she looks at my website and it speaks to her because it's not going to speak to everyone. Mm. And now I understand there's no point at speaking to everyone because not everyone has experienced grief and loss. Mm. Not everyone can afford me, you know, things like that. So it's only going to speak to a very small number of people. And that's fine because I've only got so many hours in the day. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so it's just like, whew. Can't help everyone. And yeah. there is someone out there for everyone. I firmly believe that. But I can't help everyone. No, and I think that's and going back to what I was saying about if you're speaking to everybody, you're speaking to nobody. This is kind of like another one of those um, pros of niching, of you know choosing your nest and building your nest for the people that you want to work with, is if everybody who wanted a website built emailed me today it would probably bring my email servers down because <laughs> it would just like crash the whole system and I it would break my business it would break my health I would not be able to fulfill all of those orders and I know for a lot of the people that we know in business we start these businesses we come into these lines of work that we're in because we want to help people more often than not, because we work with like therapists and coaches, we've come to this through some personal experience. So we kind of know the transformation that's available and want to support others through that transformation. And we come there, we come into these things with the biggest intentions, the biggest heart, so caring and wanting to change the world through this service that we can offer, which is great. And like, we should completely hold on to that. And so we think, but this thing that I can do can help everybody. Like anybody who's ever been in this situation could benefit from this thing. And that's true. But like you said, like there's somebody for everybody and you're not necessarily the person to help everybody because you can't, <laughs> you physically can't. I mean, I, I might advertise use that word what I do um as I'm here for women introverted women who've experienced grief and loss but I actually do have male clients as well and I talk about helping midlife women who are balancing so many responsibilities you know family their family to start with their friends their work space and then forget about themselves and, you know, the straw that breaks the camel's back is the one that has them coming to me. I'd love to see them before that happens. So that doesn't happen. But often it is a crisis point that they're at and they don't know who to turn to, who to talk to, who's going to listen to them. Um, so, yeah, so even though I think this is one of the the sticking points for finding a niche is that whole thing of, but, if I only advertise to certain people, I won't have enough clients. And what I would say to that is you'll be understood by more people mm. and you won't actually have people wasting your time either. Um, and as I say, I might, I might advertise to women, but I, I do have men clients as well. I don't turn anyone away if the, what they tell me fits with the modality that I use. I can't help everyone. I haven't the um, the knowledge and the skills to help everyone. You really got to think about going to your GP, your general practitioner, 
the general practitioner is your gateway into the NHS, usually. And if you can't get into them, you go to accident and emergency. And if you think about what happens when you go to either one or the other, you actually end up having to see someone who specialises in what's wrong with you. And it's the same thing with niching. In hospitals, if it's your heart, you see a cardiologist. If it's your gut, you go to the gastroenterology unit. If you break a bone, it's orthopaedics. Orthopaedics don't do everything else. A heart surgeon won't operate on your brain. And this is, this is one of the, the things that you, you, you might not even know what you want to specialise in, what eventually you want to be known as an expert for initially. And I think that's the confusing part. Mm. Is, but I know I can help everyone because that's what my modality tells me. But actually, it's the same for a doctor. They, they learn everything in their first five years. And then they go out into the workplace to see what they like. And then they start to specialise. They go down a particular road and become known for, for that particular thing. Rarely do you get doctors that are all over the place. And I think, I think that's where becoming a GP comes in because they might have a lot of interests. And then within a GP practice, you'll find that someone does specialise and does minor surgery, but they don't want to go on and be full-time surgeons, you know, in a hospital just doing one thing, but they'll do minor things. I had a lump on my knee years ago that was a fatty lump and had it removed, wide awake, sat there, local anaesthetic, watched the doctor chop it out of my knee and um, stitched it up away I went. But she... She was a GP first and foremost. She liked a lot of information. She liked a lot of facts about lots of different things. And it's almost like you could see her brain doing a jigsaw puzzle when someone was sat in front of her. And then she specialised in having a minor surgeries clinic. But she still couldn't reach everybody, no matter mm. how much she tried. She didn't have enough hours in the day. So people still needed to go to hospitals to have operations done. And so I think this thing that... I can treat everyone. Actually, you don't have time to treat everyone. You absolutely have to look at how big a nest. I love this. I love this whole picture of this nesting thing now. Um, how big a nest you actually realistically can manage. Mm. Yeah. And <coughs> I think there's a, there's a few points <laughs> I can go back to what you just said. I know. Um, yeah. <laughs> So going back to what you were saying about, you know, you advertise, if we want to use that word, to women and yet you have some male clients. And what I always say to people is like, it's not about exclusion. I mean, take this podcast, for example, called Talking to Introverts. We don't have a big banner on it saying no extroverts, extroverts allowed. You're not allowed to listen to this if you're not an introvert. But more introverts will listen to it than extroverts or if extroverts listen to it it's probably to understand an introvert and that's because why we started this podcast is there wasn't much out there for introverts particularly and we knew that there, there must be other people like us who were in business and are introverted um, and it's again going back to that oh no that's for me I'm an introvert that's for me and that feeling seen and feeling understood. But as I say, it's not, you know, it's not that nobody else is allowed to listen to it. And I think that's the thing that, like you say, is quite misunderstood or becomes a sticking point for people about choosing a niche. It's like, oh, but what about these people? I could help them and I could help these people and I could do this thing. And you might get to the point where you do all those things. But to begin with, let's you know simplify like one of my key words is keep it simple and just start with one thing one group of people and go from there and I think just because you do you start with one thing doesn't mean that you can't change yeah I think that's the other thing that bothers people but what if I want to change mm. okay so pivot 
in whatever way is going to work for you. I didn't start out with grief and loss being my specialism. It wasn't there, but it is now. Mm. <laughs> my God, it is now. Uh, but I bring in the tools I use are the same regardless of the specialism. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And that's the, the other thing I was going to go back to from what you were saying before is like, you can, so when I work with clients, I ask them to choose a niche. And like you say, that might change, but we need to start somewhere. We need to start talking to somebody. And like you say, that might completely change. You might do a complete 180 and you go in a completely different direction. And that's okay too. Sometimes your, what we might call your true niche your true calling will find you and it'll take time. So I'm thinking of one client who is a women's embodiment coach and she started off kind of women's embodiment coaching was the niche, which, you know, it is quite a, a niche topic these days. It's becoming more known, but, you know, but then after a year in business, she realized that actually midlife rage was her actual thing. Like that was the thing she was passionate about. That was the thing that she was noticing in her clients. And that became her niche. So although she chose one to begin with, it became more defined and more specific as she went through her business. And that's okay too. We kind of have to suck it and see. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> But I think it's always important to choose one group of people to talk to through your messaging, through your marketing, through your advertising to start somewhere so that some people, one group of people will connect with you. And that's where, like, as soon as you can start working with people who kind of get what you're about, that's when your niche will become niche <laughs> I was just thinking of another way of explaining it. And I was in a garden centre yesterday and I thought, oh, interesting, just as you were talking, that if you walked into a garden centre and the plants were just all jumbled up, how the heck would you know what you wanted? <laughs> and it's that whole thing of if roses weren't in one corner and apple trees in another and herbs over on that side and your annuals in another space you could buy a whole load of plants and put them together and then wonder why they don't work mm. because you're trying to do everything in one and, tiny space whereas and also all of those plants want different <coughs> conditions yes that's what i was going to say the soil will be won't work for all of them mm. so if you're the soil are you going to work for everyone? If someone's an apple tree and your soil doesn't work for that apple tree, you're, it's not going to work. And it's just that whole thing of how else could we discuss this so that people, women in particular in business, start to understand either through the customers that come to them with, I don't know, it might be that what you want, who can we talk about? <laughs> What business can we talk about? Um, so, okay, I'll talk about nutrition because that's how I started um, as a nutritional therapist. I did this course. And I can recall there were two younger than me women on this course and they actually lived on the same street. But they didn't know that until they came to the course. And um, one of them was getting really upset about the other who was going to advertise herself as nutritional therapist. Well, how are we both going to get clients? I said, well, do you both know the same people? Well, no, but she might get more than me. Well, it doesn't matter. What's your interest within nutritional therapy? Who do you want to help? Um, well, I had problems with fertility, so I want to help women who are having problems with fertility. Brilliant. I mean, what a great niche to have. And the other woman was like, oh, no, I'm into raw food. I want to teach people about raw food. Still nutritional therapy, but look at how different those topics are. And that's what we're getting at, is that you can, there can be a 100 nutritional therapists in the room, and each one of them will have chosen a different path to go down. It's all similar, 
you could all help anyone, but actually if you get specific, then that's what matters. Mm. It's like with acupuncture. If you want, let's use fertility again. There are some amazing acupuncturists that help women with fertility. And it's just like, yeah, because that's such a niche group. Not every woman has fertility issues, but those that do are willing to seek out the treatment for it. Mm. I mean, there's so many things, aren't there, that there's so many modalities now. There are so many more uh, named modalities that if you don't understand what the modality is, if you don't understand, i.e. what the form of treatment is that you're going to get, then someone needs to talk to you about what your problem is that they can help you with. Mm. And I think that's that's a big part of like the niching. I know quite often some people will think, well, it has to be like we've talked about, like one of your niche descriptors is midlife women. And that's a very demographic description of a niche. And quite often what I hear is like, well, I don't, you know, I work online, so it's not local people, you know, it's, you know, and quite often our niche won't be a demographic particularly, it'll be a psychographic. So it'll be the problem, like the issues that they're having that you can solve for them or help to solve for them. And that's what we want to get to. So the, so an example of like um, a local restaurant, their niche will be more often than not people in the local area in a certain radius catchment area. Um, but also if somebody seems to, happens to be driving through, I don't know, on a long journey from somewhere to somewhere else and they just happen to pass it and it's about dinner time, that restaurant is not going to turn them away just because they're not local. Whereas with us working online and a lot of the business women that we interact with, you know, work predominantly online, the world is literally our oyster. We could get clients from anywhere. And when you think of it like that, you're never going to run out of clients. <laughs> you know, there's literally however many billion people on the planet. Yeah. Um, and that's where we want to hone in on what it is like what's the problem they're having more often than not they will have tried like many solutions or looked for many tried many different uh, modalities or services in, in to try and solve this problem and they will want somebody who can talk to them about the problem they're having and the solution that you can offer and there was something else I was going to say, and it's completely gone out of my head. I just had another example of how you can look at niching. And it's that, because you just mentioned restaurants and going out to eat. And there's something for everyone out there. Mm -hmm. But how do you choose if you don't know a place? So I always think this. So it's like, if you love Italian food, aren't you going to go in search of an Italian restaurant to go mm. get your pasta or your pizza? Would you necessarily go to a, let's, you know, if you want pizza, would you go to McDonald's for pizza? You don't, do you? It's not what you do. Without us realising it, we recognise certain brands and certain names and we know what we're going to get when we walk through the door. Mm -hmm. We know that a Carluccio's Italian is going to be very different to going to McDonald's. And we also know that within coffee chains as well, that they have different things. You know, the coffee's different. The chocolate's different. The sandwiches are different. The environment's different. And we know what we like, you know, whether it's Costa or Starbucks or Nero's or whoever it is that's on the high street. We know that we prefer one over the other. We might not know why, but we just like the environment. We like the nest that we're going to go and sit in. And we like the food that we're being fed while we're sat in that nest. I mean, our favourite's canoops. But <laughs> let's just give a plug for canoops. Because canoops has niched itself with various chocolate drinks, from being the whitest white to the darkest dark chocolate. You can get them hot, you can get them cold, you can add in flavours. 
but Canoops is known for chocolate. It does coffee, it does tea, it's there, but it's aiming at people who want to have a really good hot chocolate. That's its niche. Um, what else is there? What other examples could you give us to things that are niche, but we might not necessarily recognise that they are? Anything and everything that we come across in in life from a sense of paying money for stuff. So every business that we come across generally will have niched in some way. So um, imagine you you need some home improvement work done. Maybe you need the bathroom tiling. Would you go out and look for just an any, old hand, <laughs> any old handyman yeah. who can do this job and that job and that job and this job and that job? Or will you look for a bathroom tiler? You're going to go for the one that specialises in the thing that you, you want doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. I wonder why it is... I, I, I'm going to blame the courses now. This is just my point of view. You don't have to listen to me or, you know, align with me in any way, shape or form. Um, but I firmly believe that, that there are a lot of courses you can do out there as coaches, as therapists, as um, what's another word for it? Acupuncture, whatever, whatever is there is on the end of a word um, that don't teach you how to start and run a business they just teach you the course they give you yeah. all information so of course you think you can help anyone but they don't teach you how to find that one thing that you know that you could do for the next 10 years and not not what not get fed up with mm. that's a really good point that not getting fed up with it so what i have found with clients that I've worked with, women in business I've had conversations with, is like quite often they will find that they have this one client or multiple client who's just a headache from start to finish. Maybe they want a discount before they sign up, but then, you know, they've paid cheaper because you've given in because they've badgered that much. So they've paid you less and yet they want you to deliver the sun on a plate they're the ones that always have um, a sticking point, always have a question, always have this query that they need help with. And they're not the clients we want to work with. <laughs> Let's just say it. They're not. Yeah. And I think that's when you choose the clients that you want to work with, which is what niching is. You know, it's choosing the type of people that we want to work with and the people that we can truly help. That is going to happen less. And you're going to get more enjoyment and more fulfillment from working with those clients from serving those clients because they're the clients that get you as the business owner as the coach as the therapist as whatever and you get them because they're the people that you really love to work with and that's what we're looking for it's not keep going back to this point it's not about excluding everybody else because you're a bitch and you know you don't want to help them it's not having that mindset. It's like, no, but these are the people that I can truly, truly help. And I want to put all my attention on that. Yeah, I could help these possibly, but these are the people I know I can help and that I will enjoy helping. I think, because well, I think we're allowed to enjoy our businesses. No, we're not. <laughs> Work hard. Work is difficult. Um, yes. Why would you want to enjoy being in business? Good Lord. What an interesting point of view that is. Um, I forgot my point now. What was I going to say? Oh, I don't say something else. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to go for it then. And it's just like blown away. <laughs> Tweety birds around my head. At the um, maybe it'll come back. Maybe it won't. I don't know. Can't remember. No, it's not coming. No, it's really not, is it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, yes, I've got it. So... One of the things I think happens is that, say, there's, I mean, there's the word coaching. And people think that because they can coach, that's what sells them. If someone's a hypnotherapist, it's the hypnotherapy they sell. It's the technique they sell. So as a nutritional therapist, I made the mistake of selling nutritional therapy mm. rather than what 
problem I could solve with nutritional therapy. So I constantly talked about the modality itself rather than how I could use that modality to help the person. And since knowing you and um, learning from you, it's like I've made that switch in my brain and now I don't even know if my website even talks about the modality I use, but it is a combination of things as well. Mm. Um, but it's it's more the problem I can help with that I've begun to recognise. I look for the people who I think can help me with my problems when I'm going to pay someone. Now, yeah. I might not necessarily tune in to, say, let's talk grief and loss, which is what I do, someone who specifically talks about grief and loss. But I know enough now within the work I've done, the people I can trust with um, my vulnerability to want to sit in front of them and actually let it all out, let it all out and work out a way around whatever the issue is. Mm. Yeah, and I think that's a, a really good point that this is a huge generalization, but I'm going to say it anyway. Yeah. Clients don't care how you solve their problem. They don't care what modality you use, what practice you use, what therapy you use. They just want their problem solved. And as I said, like a lot of people will probably come to you where they have tried so many things and are still in this situation. So the person, so in that scenario, if you were that per, that client customer person and you had this problem that you'd been dealing with for years and years and years and had not found any long-standing um suitable sustainable result solution and you're looking for somebody to help you with this problem now are you going to go to the person who says well i use this therapy and this has been proven to help this problem this problem this problem this problem this problem and there's a list of like 20 different things that it could help with and on there somewhere in the middle is your problem or are you going to go to the person who says, I deal with this problem. All of my clients have come to me with this problem and I have solved it for them. I know that in this, when you're in this situation, you feel X, Y, Z. To solve that, we'll do steps one, two, three. Which one are you going to go to? <laughs> you're going to go to the person who talks fully about the problem that you're having rather than the person who says that they can solve these 20 different problems but don't really go into any depth with any of them but they use this modality so and i think i think on that like like you were saying about when therapies and coaching practices are taught the people who are training in these these modalities get so caught up in this this world like they think that everybody knows what an acupuncturist is and what they do and everybody knows what a hypnotherapist is and what they do. And it's not the case. Like, it's not always the case, like you were saying, about somebody who's dealing with fertility issues. Probably the first thing that comes to mind is IVF. Yeah. It's probably not going to be acupuncture. And yet people who are acupuncturists will know that actually it has a really good benefit for fertility issues. So... Although we as the business owners, as the practitioners, as the therapists know our therapy, our modality inside out, not everybody else does. And I remember this when I had the skincare business. Um, after the first couple of years, I stopped talking about the harsh chemicals that were in mass produced skincare because everybody knew that by now, surely. And yet, like 10, 15 years later, newer companies to the business, to the industry, we're talking about it. I'm like, but we covered that. Like, that's done, surely. But no, in my head it was, because I knew this this industry inside out. But not everybody else, not every customer did. And I think that's one of the problems that we come across, is like we expect potential clients and people out there, you know, regular people, <laughs> I don't know what to call them, but the non-practitioners, we expect them to know what the word hypnotherapy means. We expect them to know what the word acupuncture means. And it's not necessarily the case. No. So you need to sell, sell your solution rather than your service. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does to yeah. me. Yeah, because we've had this conversation so many times. So yeah, <laughs> it does to me. Um, 
was there something else on this matter? Like where, what would you suggest, because um, you're working with clients to help them with their branding of their website. So what are some of the things that you suggest they look to do if they're confused, if they don't know where to start? Um, so if it's somebody who has been in business for a while, like a year, say, and has some some clients under their belt sort of thing, you know, they've worked with a few clients. Who are the clients that you absolutely loved working with? And, you know, if you want to, on the flip side of that, who are the ones that you absolutely didn't like working with? And then of those people who you love to work with, what's the thread that runs through all of them all of those projects that you worked on with those clients all of those solutions that you gave to those clients all those problems that those clients had where's the common thread and if you can find that then that's going to be a big indicator to who it is that you want to serve who your niche is and if you can't find that if there are if you've had more of the clients that you didn't like working with than the ones that you did like working with find the common thread there and avoid it <laughs> like do the complete look for the complete opposite people and if you haven't been in business if you haven't had clients if you are completely new to this business malarkey and haven't had any, worked with any clients yet just choose somebody like what's your interest like you were saying about those two nutritional therapists one was really interested in raw food one had experience in infertility issues and really wanted to support people with that like, what's that for you? I think that's where your own experience helps. What has your experience been? And why did your experience take you down the road of mm. learning this technique, this modality? Um, and I think that's a massive, yeah, just a massive way to go about it. So it might be that if someone said to you, I mean, if someone said this to me, I'd be like, yeah, okay, great. Um, I really suffer with terrible anxiety. I can't sleep at night and all of this. To me, that's a juicy problem to you. It might be, oh, good grief. No, no, thank you. I don't want to go anywhere near that. But yeah. your modality will tell you that you can help that. But actually, it just, you know, it's that real heart sink moment. But someone could come to you um, what else do people, because I'm so focused now on stress and anxiety and <laughs> overwhelm and all of that. I can't think what else there used to be uh, out in the world. What else do people have issues with? Well, I remember years ago, I um, was in like a little mastermind circle with um, a lady who was a hypnotherapist. And she specialised in, I hope I remember the word, emetophobia. So the fear of being sick or the fear of other people being sick. I'm like, wow, that's yeah. like really specific. And, and I was like, and my question to her was like, is there enough of that? You know, uh, enough clients for you to do that? And she's like, yeah, it's one of the biggest phobias people have. And that to me is like, like m having never done any hypnotherapy or been in that sort of world, like I wouldn't even consider that was a speciality. That's it was her speciality. Yeah. That's taking a fear, just one fear. You think mm. of all the fears there are in the world. Yeah. Fear of, I mean, fear of heights, fear of, the, like, fear of spiders. I mean, like the, the thing that I mostly knew about hypnotherapy before I started to meet more and more hypnotherapists as we do through networking was it helped people stop smoking. Yeah. That was the one like yeah. reference point I had for hypnotherapy. I was going to say that if, if someone came to me with, um, can you help me to stop smoking? I could. Mm. but it's, you're not my ideal client yeah because what i would want to know is why did you start let's go back shall we <laughs> what was the fear that you had that actually got you on the road to smoking but with mm. stop smoking people want that you sort my brain out for me i don't want to do the talking yeah i just want to stop smoking for health reasons or whatever reasons you, know, and you, that, might, you might be into helping um, young couples with relationships you might be into helping midlife couples you might be into helping older couples you know you can really really focus in on a big headline and then find the nitty-gritty underneath it mm. what really is a juicy problem that you like to solve circling back to what you were saying about those two nutritional 
nutritional therapists as well it's like that's where you become collaborators rather than competitors yeah because like you were saying if if somebody can come to you with want to stop smoking it's not your thing oh but I know this person over here who specializes in that I'm going to refer you on to them and like the nutritional therapists if one went to the raw food person because they were sort of a little bit interested in exploring this raw food thing and then it comes out that they've got fertility issues oh I know that like she's literally down the road who specializes in fertility issues let me give you her name wait you know there's there's enough people in the world that we can do that we don't have to feel like we have to know everything and know and know how to solve everybody's problem that one person comes to us and we have to keep tight hold of them yeah there's enough clients and customers around that we can be that collaborator with another person another business that actually I could do this but this person is going to serve you better yeah and I think that also helps to build your tr- build trust in you as a business owner you as a brand that you have integrity that you know you will say hey I don't know everything I'm not the best person to help you right now but this person yeah I know she's amazing yeah yeah I once um many years ago now when I was with Access Consciousness and um, several of us were Access Bars practitioners, um, we would get together to have a discussion about our businesses and what was happening and what wasn't happening. And the, the, one of the biggest fears was that we were each going to take each other's clients. And I was like, <laughs> hang on a minute. And so I, I ran a load of numbers and just the in a Chester population was something like 73,000, probably a lot more than that now because we've had a lot of building work around Chester. Um, and the other ladies who I got together with didn't even live in Chester. You know, they were in Wales, in, um, I can't remember, uh, St. Helens maybe, somewhere like, or on the Wirral, somewhere like that. I'm like, how many people live in your area? How many of those, literally, if you took all the children out that you don't want to see, if you took everyone over 80 out of the equation that aren't your ideal client, how many are left? How many Mm. hours do you think you have in the day that you can see these clients? You know, stop with the competition. I can't bear it. I can't bear it. Um, (laughs) Because it's just, I think it's unhealthy. I think it's a lot about the individual if they have to gather people into their nest. Let's go back to where we started with niching and never let them out. Mm. <laughs> it's going to be a very crowded nest. And, and also the individual that, with the nest are going to have your own health issues. Yeah. And like from the client point of view, that is going to be so off putting. People can pick up on your desperation as a business owner. Um, and I'm going to use that word, whether it's like, you know, the, you put on an event and the event date is coming clear near and near and you're like oh well have it at this price no hang on we can do it cheaper have it at this price people can pick up on that and the same when you are trying to hold on tightly to clients people can pick up on that as well and um oh my goodness it's one of those uh, conversations where things keep coming into your head and then going yeah it's just like oh it's a big topic isn't it there's yeah. a lot to this um, there's a lot that has to be said um, and even just listening to this you might still be confused you might still not know what you want to do and actually that's when um, perhaps taking a course in finding your niche is worth doing where you can just let all those confusing thoughts and worries and fears and competition issues just voice them to someone and then start to drill down on who you are and who you want to serve. Um, you just cut out then. Like, I couldn't hear you at all. <laughs> um, yeah, you did freeze, so I'm hoping that my my speaking <laughs> carried on. <laughs> well, we'll see. If not, we'll just leave that, ha- that cliffhanger there. <laughs> <laughs> I could see by your gestures that uh, it was a really good point you were making. I was. I'm not <laughs> going to make it again. <laughs> Is there anything else you want to say on this topic right now? Oh my goodness, there's so much more we could say on this topic. Maybe we should leave that there for today. 
yeah it's a it's a conversation we can come back to again um especially you know if you listen to this and you want to hear more about this or have certain questions about it do put them in the comments and we will know that we can talk about this again or we yeah. can answer your questions in the comments or yeah. Yeah, we'd love to hear from you. We always love a bit of feedback, um, <laughs> um, whether that's through email or messaging or in, if you're not in our Facebook group, the Business Enrichment Cafe, you can join us there and comment there. Um, we tend to pop the podcast here, there and everywhere so that in the hope that people, introverts in particular, find it. But if you are an introvert listening and you know an extrovert, I actually think it's worth extroverts hearing this so that they have more of an understanding of us and what happens for us uh, in, out in the world. Mm. Yeah. And also niching in business is a topic for anybody and everybody. Yes, it absolutely <laughs> is. You don't have to be an introvert <laughs> to understand it at all. Are we done? I think we are done. So thanks, everyone. Thanks for being with us. Sammy, say your goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye from me. Talk to you soon. Bye.